steps back, strides forward. 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 Eight seconds to go. Seventeen seconds now. They are not going to make it. Those runners definitely, definitely won't make the cutoff. You have to be on that final stretch right now. And uh, look at that. It looks like carnage. As uh, we see two minutes, one minute, one second to go rather. Time is up. There goes the gun. And the comrades is officially over for... This is Strides Forward. I am your host and producer, Cherie Louise Turner. And what you just heard was the end of the 2019 Comrades Marathon. If you've been listening to the podcast, you know that this first season revolves around stories that have a strong connection to Comrades. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. For this episode, what you need to know is that Comrades is a 90-kilometer or 56-mile running race that takes place each year in South Africa. It's the largest and oldest ultra-distance race in the world. In 2021, Comrades turns 100 years old, and over 27,000 runners were entered in the 2020 event. Something else to know about Comrades is that it has a hard cutoff time. The second the clock hits 12 hours, the finish gun goes off, and no more runners are allowed to cross the finish line. The steady stream of runners still pouring into the finish stadium are diverted from the finish line, and they don't get a medal. They are not official finishers of the race. This may sound harsh, and it is, It's a very dramatic and emotional part of Comrades, and it also makes becoming a Comrades finisher very meaningful. And experiencing these exact final moments in the 2019 Comrades was this runner. I'm Karen Williams, and I live in Cape Town, South Africa. And when asked about her experience in sports before running, Karen says, I have basically no athletic background. Back before she started running, Karen describes herself as a couch potato, and she wasn't looking to change that. And then, in 2011, my sister joined the running club, Iteko, and she said they actually help you from starting from nothing to become a runner. So you start to run slower than you can walk, just to start running and then build up from there. And she begged me to come join them, and I said, no, I'm not interested. I'm not a runner. Karen's lack of interest was ultimately outdone by her sister's encouragement. She joined the running team. Oh, this is actually, it's nice because it's something that you can do. I never thought I could run, but they showed me how to start slowly and then building up a bit. Karen almost immediately realized that this running thing was something she could actually do. So you push yourself a little bit and then you see, oh, I can do that. Or you see, oh, this is very hard. I almost died, but I didn't. And yeah, I'm I'm getting better. And she saw the greater benefits that running could bring to her day-to-day life. And what I also found is that it made you feel so much better, you know, it clears your head a little bit it's you know, I think the endorphins it's so just that I think that is what made me continue with it because you could have a bad day and then you run and then you feel so much better endorphins as well as shedding a few pounds were a welcome byproduct of Karen's new interest but there was an even more critical factor that kept her coming back Well, in the beginning, I was just amazed that I could do it. And it was such a community of non-runners trying to run. And we, you know, you would talk and you have this bond and you talk to new people. So it was all that, you know, the camaraderie. And, And I mean, our club helped a lot with, you know, training because I can't run on my own. I would never run. I would run to the corner and turn back. And less than a year after Karen joined her club, she lined up for her very first event. I did my first 10 kilometer. I cried in the end. I never knew I could do that. And it was just amazing. But what Karen perhaps didn't even realize about herself at the time was that she had a curiosity to see just how far her body would go. 
I started with a 10 and I stuck to this and I'm like, this is my distance, 10. And then I thought, let me try a 21. Oh, okay, I can do that. And then later, say about four years later, I thought, oh, okay, let me try a marathon. So yeah, I, I, I gave myself plenty of time to ease into things. But something that was going to take a little longer to ease into was her outlook on comrades. I thought it was a great race for crazy people. And she'd even worked out the logic on her take of the race. Um, why would you want to run the whole day running? It didn't make sense. Who wants to do that? But again, slowly, Karen's curiosity to push the limits of how far she could run began to build. She ran two oceans, which is 56 kilometers or 35 miles. It's another of South Africa's massively popular ultra running events. And she had another family member to turn to for comrades' insights. And then as I ran more and as I talked to my brother who did it, I thought maybe one day I will try it. And that one day came about in a very simple way. I thought I would go spectate last year. And then my friend said, why don't you just go and run it? I'm like, oh, no, I could never. But then I thought about it. And then um, the entries opened. And I thought, let me enter. But entering and wrapping your mind around the challenge that is comrades don't necessarily go hand in hand. And then, but but I ended it and I started to train with my club and I just, every time I thought of comrades, I got so nervous I wanted to cry. So I thought, I'm just not going to think about it. I'll just do the training. So I just went through the programs And I didn't think of comrades for a long time. (laughs) But blinders will only get you so far down the road. Then closer to the time, I thought I must get my mind right because going in like this, I won't make it. And I even told my one friend because we used to train together and we were both nervous. And I said to him, listen, if we go in that day and we think we're not going to make it, we won't make it. So we need to get our confidence up and think that we will make it, and then we will. Now that Karen had decided to mentally embrace the challenge of comrades, she was ready to talk about it and sought advice from previous comrades' finishers. They said, you will get fed up. You will feel tired. You will feel like you don't want to anymore. But you must just keep on going. Even if you go a bit slower, even if you walk, you must just keep going. Don't give up. I think that was the best advice. Armed with advice, head wrapped around the enormity of the event, Karen was ready for race day. The morning, I was a bit nervous, but but excited more. And I'm like, yes, it's here now, and I'm going to do this. Yes, positive. I can do it, and I will do it. I was just excited, and everything was just wonderful in the beginning. And I felt good, and I felt strong. Karen and her brother had decided to run together, but they also had a pact. If either one was faltering, the other one was free to carry on alone. No questions asked. The goal time was 11 hours, 30 minutes. So they'd have a 30-minute cushion to make the 12-hour cutoff. We went through the halfway, and we were a little bit behind our 11.30 time, finishing time. And we were still running together nicely. And then he said, we need to make up a little bit of time. And I I saw this big hill in front of us. And I said, well, that's not going to happen now. Maybe later, but definitely not now. And he thought that I've given up a bit or didn't want to continue. And yeah, he was 
but I think disappointed. So I said, okay, now this is the point where you must just go and I'll just carry on on my own. Karen had no intentions of quitting, but she also wasn't game for speeding up. Her brother didn't want to leave her, but Karen didn't want her slow pace to put him in jeopardy of not finishing within the 12 hours. If she wasn't going to make it, she wanted to do that on her own. So I said, no, definitely you must go. And then I went up the hill very slowly. And, and then I just continued on my own. And, and what I said to him also when he left, because he was like, you must now do this time. I said, whatever, the only thing I can do now is just to try my best. And that's what I'm going to do. One foot in front of the other. In the heat, up and down hills, without shade cover, Karen kept moving forward. So I still felt fine, and I could still continue. And then the rest of the time, was it was just, there's a lot of, well, up and downs on the race, but also emotionally. Like, like later, I felt so fed up, I'm like, why it's so long in the day we're still running when is the end of this race and during this time when the going was getting tough karen remembered something a friend had said before the race my one friend said you know you must get something that's gonna get you through so you must think of what's gonna motivate you to do this race so in that times when it goes bad or when it's difficult, you must think, what is my, why am I doing this? So as I was running and I felt a bit fed up, I remembered what he said and I and I thought, what was my, why am I doing this? And I thought and I thought and I couldn't remember what was my reason. That thing that was going to push me through, I couldn't remember what it was and I just thought, I'm just going to trust that I had a good reason sometime that I now can't remember because all this seems like just a bad idea. But I'm going to think that I had a reason and I'll just continue. So Karen had her mantra. Well, sort of. And however she was making it happen, she was committed to continue. But the possibility loomed that she just wasn't going to make it in time. I did think at one stage, or more than one stage, that I was not going to make it. And as she approached the final climb, which is called Polly Shorts, and is within about 10 kilometers of the finish, she got confirmation as to exactly how close she was to not finishing. Yes, I saw the vans, and I, yes, I saw them all the time towards the end. Um, I made all the cutoffs, the last cutoff at Polly Short I made with two minutes to spare. The vans Karen mentions, which are also called sweeper vans, are there to pick up runners who are being pulled out of the race. Along the route, you have to reach various intermediate points by a certain time to continue. The idea is that if you don't reach each point within the prescribed time, you won't be able to finish within 12 hours. And there is one final van that continues all the way to the end. It works as an indicator in the final miles. If you're ahead of the final sweeper van, you're probably going to make it. If you're behind, you probably won't. Karen had only two minutes of wiggle room and six more miles to go. But I thought, let me still try. Let me still just try my best and try to make it. Just keep going, walking and running and walking and running. Just try to get there. That is it. Even if you feel down, just don't stop. Just go and then try to find some strength again and go a bit faster. The pressure was on, but Karen realized one major upside to her strategy. I wasn't painful at all. I think I went slow enough not to have pain. See, that's the that's the the the, the secret. She must go slow, then you won't have pain. <laughs> and then after Polly shorts, my mood was also a bit lighter because 
it's so close to the end. I made this final cutoff. I must now just make it. And then I actually went a little bit faster than I did in that in the previous bit. And I thought, okay, maybe if I can run a bit faster. Then I ran and I'm like, oh, look at that. I'm going faster. Oh, look, I can even go faster. I don't know where that came from. And as darkness began to fall, with an entire day of running behind her and only a few miles left, Karen powered on. It was now just down to whether or not she could get to the finish line before time ran out. Close to the end, there's you run through a, a, a neighborhood and the people are outside the houses and they were very encouraging. They're like, you go, girl, you rocking this. And I thought, yes, I'm rocking it. <laughs> so everyone was just so encouraging. But yes, that sweeper van was still in front of me. I couldn't catch him. With the final sweeper van in sight and energized by the enthusiastic crowds, Karen closed in on the finish and the minutes ticked down. She went through the final tunnel and along the big sweeping curve that skirts the gathering areas outside the finish stadium where race finishers, friends, family and spectators have been congregating for hours, rejoicing and recovering, and cheering on all the runners who have yet to finish but are so close. Then Karen entered the grand stadium itself, with the stands and the lights and the announcers, and the final push to the line. As the clock ticked down, the cheering intensified, urging those on who will be among the last to finish. And there are dozens upon dozens of them. This isn't the trickle of stragglers you might be picturing. There's a constant flow of runners trying to get to that finish line. Many are struggling and delirious, moving in the herky-jerky ways that only happen when you've pushed yourself to the very edge. Athletes stumble and weave and even crawl. Some fall and get up again and again, barely able to stand, let alone walk or run. And some just lay down and give up. And some, like Karen, are still running, picking their way through the thick tangle of those who had been running ahead of them. And in the stands, everyone's eyes dart from the runners to the finish line, where a large display clock counts up the time second by second. I hear all the people screaming, and you see the finish line in front, with seconds to spare, you're trying to to get there to the end and there was someone who fell almost right in front of me and I had to go around that person also and then just make it to the to the timing mat and go over. These final moments of comrades are at once heart-wrenching and triumphant. This is a point of the race that's made a memorable impact on nine-time comrades finisher Kathy Hopkins. There is such love and warmth and encouragement and respect for the final runners. There's nothing like coming in towards the end. It is pandemonium. And much of it is other runners, supporters, regular people who don't have never run themselves, but are so have embraced the race uh, so much. They are cheering you on to finish the race. And I, and I do think that one of the most important things about the race is the gun fin- the gun start and the gun finish. I don't know anybody who hasn't shed a few tears watching runners coming into the stadium, you know, almost bouncing like pinballs, like off the, sometimes off the, uh, you know, the barricades as they're going in because they're having a hard time running a straight line or, you know, being helped, being helped by other runners or, you know, clearly looking like they, they've had a rough go of it. And the race announcers are there to cover every last step. We'll also get through to that finish. I know they're definitely cutting it close, but as you saw, there's a runner, I think he fell, and some runners felt the need to stop and, uh, you know, care about what is going on with that. What about what now? Over 
three, uh, just less than three minutes to, uh, towards the finish. You can see people pulling each other, just urging on and just uh, telling themselves that we are about to get there. Come on now. It's only a matter of uh, meters, perhaps. The finish line is And here. they've got you know, 20, 30 seconds to go to cross that finish line. And it just is, and if you cross at 12 hours and one second, you don't get a medal. And it doesn't matter if you're a half a stride from the finish, you just don't get that medal. And I think, you know, we've all in our lives had, I think it, I think it speaks to people because I think we've all in our lives had times when we've almost made something, when we've almost achieved something and we haven't. And we realize how incredibly difficult that is to deal with and that it's part of life. As Karen closed in on the final meters of the race, she was surrounded by the chaos and carnage of those final moments before the finish gun transforms hope to defeat. The play-by-play keeps account of the last gasps of effort. And I don't think that he will make it to that finish. Tired legs being forced on that carpet, yeah. that very, very thick carpet. Come on, by the runners. So uh, that man is crawling, but unfortunately he is much, much too far out to make it, even if he was running at this stage. So 30 seconds to go and heartbreak for many, many runners who are inside the finish line. They can hear the music. They can hear the crowds. They can see the people around them. They can see that they're at the finish. But with 19 seconds to go, 17 seconds now, they are not going to make Karen it weaved around runners who were falling and crawling or couldn't keep a straight line. And stride by stride, she kept her focus on getting across the timing mat until finally and not a moment too soon. She crossed over that magical threshold between those who made it and those who didn't. I knew they were only seconds, but I didn't know it was only one second. I didn't realize it was that close. And that's probably better. Karen finished Comrades in 11 hours, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds. With a single second to spare, she had become an official Comrades Marathon finisher. But just behind her were all of those runners who didn't. And the anticipation of just how this will all end is swapped out for the sounds indicating that this edition of Comrades Uh, has come to an end. As you said, on a heartbreak. Fendi just looking at those that just can't within a touching distance. There's another 365 days again to do it once more. You know, your heart sinks when you see this and you think about the fact that these runners put in the work. They worked hard. They qualified. And... Unfortunately, it was not a day, not today. For Karen, this moment was bittersweet. Yes, and I even saw people that was just behind me and then they closed it off and they had to be steered like more to the side. And, you know, no medal, no crossing the finish line. Yeah, that was so sad for me to see that as well. So all of that, you know, you you are really happy for yourself, but then you're sad for the other people because everyone worked so hard to get there and to make it. And some people just don't have a good day. One tick of the clock. It's arbitrary, really, but it's also significant because if you do earn that finisher's medal, it means something. To you and anyone who understands Comrades, which includes just about everyone in South Africa, from the passport check agent at the airport, to the taxi driver and hotel clerk, to every one of the tens of thousands of runners in this country that has a deep love of sports. And Karen had done it. For years, she'd built up her running distance and she'd put in the training for Comrades. She'd faced her fear of tackling such a big challenge and set her mind to believing that she could get the job done. And when it came to race day, she stuck with three simple but incredibly important tactics. 
She never gave up, she kept moving forward, and she ran her own race. When her brother wanted to go faster than she was comfortable with, she chose to go it alone. And she kept the attitude that had carried her through since she started in this sport, as she would say, let me at least try. And with that, she had earned herself a coveted Comrades Finishers Medal. Then you get your medal and it's such a great moment and you're just so happy, oh, you made it and you got the medal. And then I just wanted to cry. I just wanted to find my family and cry. It's just a lot of emotions. It's it's very emotional day. From excited to fed up to happy to just wanting to cry. It's just all of it. And like so many runners just after they finish comrades, experiencing all that once was enough. On the day, I'm like, no, uh, never, never again. And then, after a few days had passed... So then soon after, I thought I would do it again. And to keep things interesting, there's one certainty about comrades you can rely on. It will never be the same run twice. Everyone who did it, even 10 times, they say every time it's a different run. You cannot think that you know comrades now because you never know it. It's how you feel on the day, how much you trained, everything, how much you ate. So every time it's a different race and you can never be sure. Yeah, You can't say because you did it once, it will be easier. Comrades may never get easier, but there will always be ways to improve. No, I would just think that concentrate a bit more in the middle part. Not to maybe walk too much there or... Because I do think that you, you, you lose your concentration. You you just... Even though I, 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 you know, it was so hammered into my head. Keep going, keep going, keep going. So I did keep going, but maybe keep going a little bit faster. Don't slow down too much. Especially in that middle section. And however Karen approaches her next comrade's adventure, she'll have the day-to-day benefits of running far that keep her lacing up. And it just really, it gives you really that time to just clear your head and get rid of all the, I won't say depression, but you know, bad feel, not feeling so well, and it just clears everything, and then you feel so much better. I think that's the big thing. That makes me keep doing it. And for Karen, just giving it a try, first with 10Ks, then half marathons, marathons and then two oceans, and now comrades, she's accomplished something that she never would have thought she could. It's just an amazing thing to do and to be able to say that you did that. I'm still amazed that I could do something like that, that my non-athletic body can carry me through that, that it can just do it. So, and I think that is the the amazing part, that you can push yourself a little bit more to not beyond your means, but beyond what you thought you could do. There's a little bit extra, and you can try that. This concludes our story with Karen Williams. I want to thank Karen for sharing her story. Something that really struck me is that Karen stuck to some very basic principles to achieve something spectacular. She kept a positive, curious attitude, and she always kept moving forward. Something she said that really sticks with me is, let me at least try. And to that, I think, because you never know. And she also took her time to work up to a big goal. Great lessons for running and for life. Karen's story marks the second-to-last episode of our first season. Look for our final episode coming in a few weeks where we feature 1982 Comrades champion and the current Comrades Marathon chairperson, Cheryl Wynn. We're really excited to finish our season with someone who has such a deep history and involvement with this magnificent event. I was honored to get to interview her. And we're looking forward to future seasons. We're currently working on some new ideas, but we welcome your thoughts. 
Are there themes about women running long distances that you'd like to see us explore? It can be another key event or a broader theme like female running communities and teams or running and the female body. We'd love to hear from you. You can tweet to us or find us on Instagram at Strides Forward. You can always reach me, Cherie, through the website stridesforwardpodcast.com. There you'll also find full transcripts of all the shows as well as show notes complete with all pertinent links. And you'll find our runner's resources page there. Thank you to the Strides Forward team, whose voices you experience in other ways with this podcast. There's Cormac O'Regan, who makes all of the music you hear and does the sound design. And there's April Mariner of Bonfire Collaborative. She keeps the podcast branding and website looking great and up to date. And you can find April at bonfirecollaborative.com. And of course, thank you to you, the listener. I always appreciate you tuning in, and I love all the feedback and comments. I truly have a passion for these stories, and I'm always excited to know that other people are interested in them too. Until next time, this is Cherie wishing you satisfying strides forward. Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show.